I'm happy to be here. Well, um, you know, um, this uh, PowerPoint uh, is becoming very important. I used not to, when they started the computer, I couldn't think typing the computer. I had to really write when I'm thinking the, then time, but eventually. Same thing with the PowerPoint. Because somebody said, sometimes you give them the power and then they have no point. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, it makes it, <laughs> so at least let's admire the, uh, <laughs> the work that uh, uh, some students helped me uh, do here. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's really a pleasure. I can't come because of the conflict with my class. Uh, so I'm happy that the students uh, agreed uh, to, to join us. Um, <coughs> so this is the way it works. You see the, uh, the border, it's uh, the uh, adding grass symbol. All these are ideal, but they mean something. Okay. Um, well, uh, I am... Um, as the professor Ndulo said, I'm partly historian, so often I have to really start from somewhere, not exactly today, because what is happening today is the result of something that happened. Uh, but because we don't have time, uh, I'm going to skip that. All I would say is that uh, African education, uh, when we talk about African education, we thinking always these days, about the European education. But there is an African education. There's no society in human history that doesn't have an education system, including the three components consistently. One may be more prevalent than the other, but the formal, informal, non-formal are consistently uh, in existence in all societies. Otherwise, you don't have a society. Because you see, uh, education that provides that uh, anchor that provide the reference, uh, that provide the skills that are needed, that considered uh, relevant in the community that you're a member of. So, but for the this talk, uh, especially when we look at the statistics, we only look at the European statistics uh, uh, systems, uh, generated statistics. I was uh, I, I I worked for a short time. I took a sabbatical leave, and instead of going to academia, I went to the Ministry of Education in Mali. I was uh, in the planning unit, and we were dealing with the statistics. But every single morning, every evening, between home and the, the ministry, I saw a reality that was challenging the work we were doing, because there were people who were sitting there in the neighborhood learning how to read but in Arabic. And many of them were illiterate. Although the question we may ask is, how relevant is that literacy? If all that is the services, uh, you go to the pharmacy, you purchase medicine, the instructions are in French. So these are some of the issues. Uh, relevance, what is African education? And of course, also when we look at the statistics, there are still a large majority. Uh, I didn't want to bombard you with statistics, otherwise uh, the UN system has uh, sent alarming signal that a million of children are still going through this year without setting a foot in a school uh, uh, compound, uh, in a classroom. Uh, but they, those children, although they are not learning in this formal system, they are learning something. So how do we merge that? Uh, so we need to ask some very fundamental questions, philosophical questions. What model of society, what type of education uh, exists, and what time we ought to create, sustain? So these are some of the major questions uh, that um, I, I uh, work with in my in, in my some of my research, but what I would like to do here for our discussion is to emphasize the interface of gender and education for development, locating 
this convergence within the global system, the United Nations, all the international commitment for uh, gender equality, for the advancement of education. So I will go quickly through them. I mentioned here uh, at the when the African uh, countries started to uh, acquire formal leader independence, there was a, a, a seminar meeting that took place in Addis Ababa where the countries that were already independent, the ones that were still in the struggle for their formal independence, they all met and were unanimous about goals to achieve. And when they were making those, uh, adopting those resolutions, they were thinking of the European education, uh, universal enrollment rate, uh, increase uh, secondary school uh, enrollment, increase uh, post-secondary enrollment. So there was that uh, unanimous decision, although as I will explain later, the reality became completely different because when they were expected to achieve those goals that they set in Addis Ababa, uh, there was that major economic crisis that made it impossible. Uh, so much so that not only was there stagnation, but some of the countries actually uh, went through uh, decline in enrollment rate. So what happened when they declined? There is a decline in the formal enrollment rate. But the other point here is the UN involvement. Uh, in terms of global uh, engagement in the 60s, which coincided with the when most of the African countries acquired their independence, there were major resolutions. Even a decade for development was declared, uh, the global development decade. Although it was not only for Africa, but Africa was very much at the center because it was the continent that was completely uh, colonized, with a very few exceptions, uh, Ethiopia and a different kind of colonization, uh, Liberia. So um, this uh, development decade uh, was uh, followed by uh, a focus on Africa, development for <laughs> Africa. <laughs> <laughs> it's to keep you awake. <laughs> okay, so there was another resolution in 70 uh, that articulated the international development strategy for the second United Nations development decade, aimed at promoting the full integration of women. That one focused on women. And it was followed by, uh, there were several major decisions that were made. One of them that is still referred to is the CEDA, Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Some countries have not uh, uh, signed it yet, uh, including this United country. States. <laughs> yes, the United States. Sometimes they say we don't need it. We don't need the UN to tell us what to do. We are free to discriminate. That's our right. But <laughs> well, they don't say that. But that's <laughs> In that, there was a specific reference to gender, to achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls. So it, it was not uh, only, uh, it's not only recently, it has been there for a while, this declaration, this uh, commitment to achieve that goal. And that same goal is affirmed in the uh, uh, MDGs that expired in, in uh, 2015. Uh, there it talks about promoting the equality and empowerment of, of women. So the same thing, it is reinforced and is recapped in the fifth goal of the SDGs, which I will focus a little more on. Um, then with that commitment to uh, promote gender equity and uh, equality, uh, it was decided by the UN that it's important to bring people together from all over the world. So four major conferences were organized. The first one in Mexico City focused on equality of women and their contribution to development and peace. Uh, the, uh, it was a full decade and halfway evaluation was on equality of women and their contribution to development and peace again uh, uh, evaluation of that it was in Copenhagen 
that the meeting took place. And the final meeting took place on the African continent in Nairobi, Kenya. And uh, every time they produce a major document, which is the, uh, the result of a very long process of consultation, de uh, debate, and finally they agree on. It's quite, when you go to those meetings, it's an event when they finally agree on the uh, uh, document because they are always contentious issues. Uh, people who are um, uh, referring to specific, even one line, a few words, uh, that if that uh, 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 specific statement is contained in a full document of many, many pages, their country would not sign. So again, the point here is that they, every time, reach an agreement, and in Nairobi, uh, they produce the forward-looking strategy, uh, which was a review uh, and a appraisal of the achievement of the decade. And then, the, really, the one that has been most significant, uh, that has been referred to, is the Beijing uh, conference. 1995. Uh, there was a book uh, that was uh, edited uh, by a colleague uh, at uh, Binghamton University uh, on um, the global Hillary uh, that was <laughs> during the campaign. Uh, I was asked to write a chapter on the uh, Beijing because this is where she made her famous uh, uh, statement, women's rights are human rights and human rights are women's rights. And it produced a document that is still, if you do work in the UN system, uh, they will refer to you to it. If you do not uh, have uh, the Beijing platform, uh, uh, the Beijing uh, Action uh, for Equality Development and Peace Platform for Action in your reference, it means you are not fully aware of what uh, work has taken place. And then every five years, every 10 years since Beijing, uh, again, it has become the reference. Not another big, uh, a meeting has taken place. It's the Beijing plus five, Beijing plus 10, Beijing plus 15, and uh, recently, Beijing plus 20, uh, which was in, in 2015. Uh, <laughs> okay, education in African development. Um, well, here I will go really quickly, human capital, uh, and I will start at the end when I do this uh, ecological approach to uh, education. Uh, well, there have been in the education field, the debate, is education a consumption or an investment? Of course, it's difficult to disentangle that. It's, uh, it's both. Um, but basically, in the African context, at the time of when they had that meeting in Addis Ababa, uh, there is this major theory that didn't start then, it started a long time ago, um, of human capital, that there is a, a positive and, a, and a linear correlation between education and development. And, and the book that uh, when I and I are editing uh, deals with that uh, uh, concept of uh, human capital. Uh, and so that's the perspective that African countries adopted when they met, when they decided to uh, put more resources in education. Is the expectation that, it, that education would provide the necessary knowledge, skills, in order to promote socioeconomic development. So human capital theory and its practice uh, was very, were very important in the education uh, the conception of education. But then, as I mentioned earlier, in spite of all the engagement, the commitment, um, the budget uh, of uh, the uh, public budget that was allocated to education, uh, something happened. The economic crisis of the 19, oil crisis of 1974, uh, mid 1970s, and then the major economic crisis uh, led to the decline in the resources that African government had. Uh, of course, my own point is, no matter how much money they have, if they have the resolve, the decision, they would have enough to invest in education. Because uh, when the 
they are investing in other areas such as military where that money will not be available for education. But this in terms of taking into account their priorities, the areas uh, where they invest, um, there was no more, uh, not enough money in the area of, uh, in the investment for education. This is when they borrowed money from the international organization, IMF, uh, our World Bank, well known, the Structural Adjustment Program, and uh, its, uh, its uh, conditionalities, which led to a decline. In the gender, uh, there was considerable uh, progress if we look at the educational statistics from the time of independence of each country to a decade or two later, you can see clearly the expansion consistently. But then there was that period, the 1980s, characterized by this major external shock and the intervention of uh, the, uh, this international organization, bringing into African um, political space fundamental question of uh, autonomy and the meaning of independence. If the, uh, the domestic policies uh, were defined <coughs> by this international organization uh, because of the money the government had to borrow from them, then uh, there was a fundamental question of the meaning of independence. Uh, the independent is the ability to think of your problem, to find the resources for the problem, to have a line. Well, what was uh, uh, one aspect of this uh, conditionality was that um, those who were using services had to pay. So the whole idea of providing uh, basic education to the population without, uh, is never free because there are other costs such as uh, uniform books and you name it. But in terms of fee, uh, all government, even the most notorious uh, uh, dictatorship, uh, they committed to that. Providing uh, primary health care, all this was considered unacceptable in the context of the structural adjustment program. And so, if you enroll your child in first grade, you have to pay a fee. And that was the best way to discourage parents from enrolling uh, their uh, children. And the girls were the most affected, according to all the statistics. So there was decline. And about 20 countries uh, experienced that decline. I was teaching in Togo at the time uh, in a doctoral program, but you could observe it. The decline was at all the level, from basic to the higher education level. And yet, there was a meeting there to really galvanize uh, the international community to recommit to education. So there was that meeting in Jomsien, uh, 1990, another one a decade later in Dakar. But what is the important characteristic here is the focus on basic education. The argument can be very appealing that the system inherited and promoted by African countries was in essence elitist. And therefore you need to provide more money, resources to the basic level to expand access. But there was a major contradiction there because the policy of defunding higher education or the tertiary education, it also affected teacher training colleges. So in many meetings, some of us practically are asked, if you're going to define entirely higher education, where are you going to train your teachers? Where are you going to train your researchers? Where are you going to train your administrators? <coughs> so these are some of the major issues. Um, and uh, so then let's move quickly to the, uh, to the other major commitment. Uh, global commitment to tackle issues of development, Millennium Development Goals. The eight goals are there. Uh, in green is the third one, which referred to uh, promoting gender equality uh, and empowering women. Again, this, this comes again and again every time. So, um, at, but when it was uh, ending, the, for those who had uh, access to the reading, the first reading, uh, Millennium Development Goal in, in retrospect, uh, two uh, colleagues uh, and myself, uh, uh, 
uh, it was nice to work uh, with colleagues who were finishing the PhD. You have that energy. They really were the ones who pushed and we were able to finish. We have to finish this book before 2015, uh, Millennium Development Book in Retrospect. So, my, uh, beside being co um, editor, I focused on gender. Again, the interface of gender and education. Were they really serious? So what I analyze is the um, component of higher education. If you do not promote higher education, then you're not serious about the development. If you do not promote higher education about its, a specific social category, then you're not serious about the inclusion or the future of that social group. So what I did, I went through the entire uh, document, all the reports, and what was striking, but not surprising, is that higher education was lacking. It was lacking. So um, then when it ended, they moved, uh, these are some, the summary of, uh, of uh, that. So this is, these are some of the points we made in our book. That the Millennium, millennium Development Goal, um, we summarize this uh, centrality of higher education in the new African development vision beyond 2015. African countries were committing themselves to higher education. And yet this global reference didn't include anything on higher education. So I, my analysis was to see how they were um, uh, grappling with this uh, 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 global reference to development, um, promotion of, uh, of women, and yet without including higher education. But I should mention here that, uh, well, Muna is the expert uh, here, um, with the exception of the Security Council, all the resolutions that are adopted in the United Nations, they are non binding. There's, there's no legal ground for the UN to go to uh, uh, Cote d'Ivoire or South Africa or, or Bangladesh and tell them that you were supposed to have achieved such and such goals. What's happening? It, it's, there's no legal ground for doing that. It's just a, a global moral commitment. So it's, it's the responsibility of each country to return home and put in practice, dissect all these uh, documents that are adopted, and then put them into policy. So that's uh, so I'm not saying here that we should blame the UN. In fact, my uh, problem issue is that Africans are not in charge of their own uh, destiny in terms of defining what society and what resources are needed? What are the priorities? So this, are, this is my concern, but this is a reality. There's uh, too much um, in terms of the impression that the UN has said, UNESCO is recommending, but it, it will not mean anything unless the countries themselves appropriate those policies or uh, find a counter proposal to those policies in relation to their own uh, uh, internal uh, structural issues. And then uh, sustainable development goal. The number five in green is the one again that talks about um, gender equality and empowerment of women and girls. And what is the, the little bit of difference, conceptual difference between the MDGs and SDGs? The MDGs were de uh, defined in the classical uh, framework of other advanced countries helping the others that are not advanced. This, this uh, top-down approach, uh, this issue of um, um, uh, stages of development, those are, 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 are ahead and those who are far behind and out of generosity, those are, that are ahead. Uh, helping the ones that are behind. This is the way it was conceptualized. Uh, but the SDG becomes a little more conceptually different in the sense that it's a global world. Uh, gender inequality is not only 
even if they have been these global meetings uh, of all countries, but always the emphasis had been on the least uh, advanced countries. So the, the SDGs conceptually bring something new, acknowledging that there are also issues of structural inequality embedded in uh, almost every country. Even the Northern European countries that were cited as a model of a success and equality, as they become more uh, um, diversity uh, comes in, uh, we are seeing another another side of those uh, those uh, uh, countries and their policies. And so the point is that there are issues of common concern, climate change. Uh, it will affect more drastically uh, countries that do not have the resources, but it's likely to affect almost everybody. Uh, it doesn't matter how many um, million of dollars you have in your account, if the air is globally polluted, uh, well, you may be able to have your own scientists uh, uh, um, producing fresh air for yourself, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> how long can you live in, in uh, that bubble? So there's a recognition that at least some issues are of global nature. We need to work together. Uh, so, uh, but the number five here, uh, uh, gender, is what uh, I want to focus on. Yeah, um, well, these are the targets. You can read them. So we may not, uh, because of lack of time here, we don't need to go through them. But they focus all the specific things the specific aspect, the specific issues that need to be addressed in every, some, uh, some issues are all across the countries, across the globe, uh, some are specific to some society, but they are considered to be uh, issues to be of concern to the global, uh, what they call international community. Um, uh, more, um, targets, so they all revisit the previous uh, resolutions, uh, especially as I mentioned earlier, they go back to Beijing. Okay, so where, where is the situation, what is the situation in African countries focusing on higher education? Um, different countries have different situations. Um, but by and large, uh, I will go quickly, it would have been nicer to select one country, go in depth, but that one country will be just that country because the situations are different from one country to another. But there are some uh, aspects that can be generalized, um, which are that there is basically gender inequality. There is uh, usually, uh, a female underrepresentation uh, in all the fields. However, when you break it down by field, you can see that the situation is even worse. Uh, I did uh, some work for the um, UNESCO Institute for Education, which is based at uh, the University of Montreal, uh, showing the pattern of gender representation in the, in the world. And it was quite, uh, uh, revealing that when you break it down by discipline, some disciplines are almost universally one or two exceptions, uh, fields like engineering, uh, those are, are fields. They are all fields where uh, there is a, a women under representation. Very striking. But if you take a field like education, you hear it's also misleading you see over-representation of, of women. However, when you break it down, what is mean, meant by education? Uh, when they include all the first uh, grade teachers, the preschool teachers, uh, elementary school teachers, who, who are generally in many parts of the world women, this is when you have that over-representation. But when you break it down by level, primary, Secondary, high education, you see again the same gender inequality uh, uh, occurring. And then by field, you see the same gender inequality. And uh, who are the 
uh, the, the uh, professors with the endowed chairs uh, uh, who are doing the research uh, in knowledge. What type of knowledge? Uh, because we, 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 we are teaching, doing things, things in higher education institutions, but things don't just happen. <laughs> they are the result. The way institutions are organized uh, is the reflection of the thinking that goes on. So when you look at that level, you see very few women. So when they say education here again, it's very misleading. You have to break it down to see this pattern of gender inequality. So this is uh, the last uh, column there reflect that, the gender imbalance. Okay. Um, uh, again, if you look at the different fields, you will see differences. Uh, the natural sciences and statistics, you see the representation is even very uh, much smaller. And gender parity in tertiary education. Uh, here are some additional uh, way of measuring that. Uh, all the other uh, countries, except for the ones that are in, uh, in red, uh, they have um, inequality, gender inequality, uh, consistently with women as underrepresented. The ones in red, uh, South Africa, Namibia, Mauritius, and Lesotho, is where you have gender inequality, also, but it's the reverse. You have more women in the system. When you work on the campus, beautiful Roma campus in the Soto, you don't need to do any sophisticated <laughs> study. You can see with your own eyes uh, that there are more women than, than men. So the point here is that when we talk about gender inequality, we need to make a difference between gender inequality and inequality affecting women. We're focusing on women, on girls, because they are the ones who are underrepresented at the moment. But there may be conceptually and practically situations in which they are the, uh, the males are the ones who are underrepresented. I did another study in the, in the Caribbean, in, in, in Brazil, it's just striking. You have it exactly, almost exactly, the same statistics as Lesotho. The males are the ones who are almost no uh, existence on, on campuses. So that raises another set of, uh, of, of issues. Okay, quickly, the African Union, Agenda 2063, the Africa we want. Uh, if you have not read it, uh, go and read it. Well, it has made some very strong statement about gender equality by 2063. And uh, many of you know, in case you don't know, why 2063? It will be the well, Since I have some of my students here, I don't want to embarrass you. But why? <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you know, raise your hand. If you don't, let's move on. Okay. Uh, we will continue next week. One well, does then. No, oh, yes. Uh, yes, this is a new people hundred year anniversary since post colonial Yes, good. <laughs> <laughs> You're representing your class. <laughs> yes. yes, because the Organization of African Unity was created uh, in uh, 1963. So that's uh, the target there. Uh, this is where we want to celebrate that centennial. Uh, feeling that we have accomplished something in 100 years. So that's why uh, Agenda 2063. And uh, it has many, many components. I just selected the ones here. Uh, these uh, uh, Rose Mwebaza uh, 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 did a study focusing on uh, the, uh, the um, gender. So this is where, according to the Agenda 2063, uh, Africa would like to be. By 2063, all forms of violence and discrimination, social, economic, political, against women and girls would have been eliminated. And they would fully enjoy all the human rights. Hence, put an end to all harmful social practices. So, uh, see, they're all there. Barriers to access to quality health and education for women and girls would be non-existent. 
So this is, is an ideal world um, that we all want. So it says that the Africa we want. Okay. How? Yes. Exactly. So it continues here. It makes you feel good that we will get to that. Uh, <laughs> okay. But then, uh, uh, Professor Soga, how do we get there? <laughs> Reframing the African education. This is one of the issues. Uh, what kind of education? As I mentioned earlier, uh, we need to ask a really philosophical question. Education is not a, a, just a technical uh, issue where you bring those who know how to manipulate the statistics and they, they do the planning. But what are you planning for? What society? So these fundamental questions uh, have not been seriously asked. And it's not simply a matter of asking them. How do you factor them? in the decision-making process. How do you factor them in the allocation of resources? These are very important uh, uh, questions uh, that we, um, uh, meaning uh, uh, Dr. Amwako uh, and myself, uh, in the book that came out uh, recently, uh, Ubuntu, uh, Revi Re Revisioning African Education with the Ubuntu Paradigm. Uh, these are some of the uh, point that we make that unless you really revisit what African education is, in some of my other works I talk about fusion by choice. That there's no way we going we can do it, but it's not realistic to think that we're going to eliminate completely the European influence in Africa. Colonization didn't last that long, but the impact is so profound, but then it is possible. It cannot over, overcome the pre-existing, the African indigenous system that existed thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of years. But the point is, in regaining agency to rethink, and I, 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 as I mentioned, I talk about fusion by choice. Instead of have two systems that are parallel to each other, instead of uh, having those who do not have access to the European and manage to have an African a system that is not going to help them go far, except maybe a few West African women uh, traders who outperform everybody else, uh, including <laughs> I, I think I mentioned it here last time I made a presentation. Uh, Togo is one of those uh, places where you see those women. Uh, they didn't go to school, uh, but don't stand behind them in a bank when they're going to make a deposit. You'll be there for a very long time. <laughs> and they are known by their... Um, they, they, these market women in Nigeria, in Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, you see them, you recognize them. They really dress. But in Togo, for some reason, they are very humble. But the bag that they carry that looks <laughs> so ordinary is very powerful. So this, they, we have been actually thinking of that because they challenge directly the human capital theory that makes that a, a positive and linear correlation between education and a socioeconomic attainment. But these are not, uh, this is not the, uh, the, the uh, usual situation. These are exceptional groups. So how do we manage for the entire society, the entire structure, how do we manage the inherited uh, system from colonization and the foundation of African uh, education? These are some of the uh, ma uh, matters that we uh, uh, debate in that uh, edited book. Uh, happily, it is uh, Springer is very generous. It's um, online as well. The hardcover came first, but it's also accessible. So if you want to read, you can. Okay, how do we get there, Professor? Hear <laughs> this. Education, this is the way it is conceptualized. 
um, you have the input. That's a very classical, uh, uh, you know, production function model uh, that is uh, drawn from economics, where you have the input, and then you have the institutional setting where the learning takes place, and then you have the result, the output, the output that includes the cognitive skills and all the other. Uh, characteristics, uh, other attributes that uh, the education system aim at uh, pro uh, uh, developing, and then the outcome. Well, the learners' attribute, how do then, how do we manage to bring those who are in the rural communities? Even the countries that have made progress, it is observed historically that once you reach that 90% or 95%, that is that group that is very difficult to bring in in order to reach that universal enrollment. Uh, so how do we deal with that? What are the social consequences, the political consequences of being a girl? It's not simply being a girl. It's being a girl from the rural community. So how do we take all this into account? when we design the policies. So we need, if being a girl is not a problem, but it's the society, the structure of society, the values, the expectations, the practices. And it's not only the girls, they are boys. There have been situations in which um, I had advice uh, to give the, uh, the, the scholarship or the assistance to the boys, because I know the girl in the group uh, are from uh, social context where they would receive uh, support, but the boys in that particular context. So it's not only a matter only of boys and girls, it's where people live. What are the structural um, challenges that they encounter by virtue of being where they are? So it's all here. And another important matter I want to mention here uh, that really a decisive factor, the aspiration and expectation. Uh, I always make that difference. Uh, one thing I have done when I travel, I like to ask uh, informally and sometimes formally question about what do you want to do? UNICEF asked that question, what do you want to be? And the answer was, I want, when you grow up, I want to be alive. That was the answer. But my question is, what do you want to be in life? What, what are your aspirations? It is amazing how similar they are. Children, regardless of where they are located, regardless of the constraints they encounter, they all have that dream. But then there is the expectation. The expectation is the hard reality. Uh, it is said here, yeah, aspiration is you dream, you wildest dream, but you're free to dream. But when you wake up, you find <laughs> the structural uh, uh, situation that uh, make it difficult. So how do we have that synergy, convergence? Make aspiration and expectation meet for all. So these are some of the issues, how do we get there? And then uh, in terms of uh, um, equipping, the, the learning context in terms of training the teachers, not only to equip them with technical skills, but with values. Because at the end, you see empowerment uh, in the black box. The classroom has been analyzing the education system as a black box. No matter how centralized the system is, once the door is closed, what happens between the teacher and the student the presentation of the classroom as a microcosm of society becomes very, very real. So if the teacher is there to encourage, to support, it will make a huge difference. There have been many, many studies that have been talked about the self-fulfilling prophecy. You expect the children to succeed, you will do whatever you, you can to make them succeed. succeed. And you know, whatever you can is not just throwing money at them. It's really how you build their confidence. Then you help them develop their skills, make them realize that they can do it, they have capabilities. 
Um, so all these factors are important, and then the skills. This is where, if we want to think of the contemporary period, the challenges. When African countries started to become independent, the government were the major uh, providers of jobs. That has changed. So then in the new education system, how to include new values besides the cognitive skills? How do you transform those cognitive capabilities into innovative capabilities? Uh, creativity. Um, and then finally, outcome. The outcome is clear that um, you who are students here, uh, you come into Cornell for, for that. <laughs> it's not only the piece of uh, paper, but that piece of paper is important. That's what they call the labor queue. When you go into lineup and uh, asking the employer, look at my diploma from Cornell, what is the meaning? And how far is going to take you? But if a student, a young person, doesn't have anything to show at all, he or she will not be in the line. Even when you're in the line, there are all sorts of issues, social issues, discrimination. Uh, you may raise high your diploma, but the employer may see you uh, on the basis of race, on the basis of gender, on the basis of many other things. And when you start to speak, your accents will say something. So all these uh, distortions are there. But by and large, it is stated that if you are well equipped, you have a, a chance. How do you equip everybody well? That's the, the issue. So uh, to our national development. So time goes very, very fast. And uh, so uh, let's uh, go to this conclusion. Again, uh, Professor Soga, that's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because the question you ask sound everything. How do we get there? The positive and substantive equality. The positive, the notion of positive equality. For me, uh, I mentioned that there was a decline in enrollment rate at some point in the African education. Well, there was some kind of equality uh, when there was a decline, and uh, those uh, in the group that was uh, ahead reached those that were uh, behind. You have some equality there, but that's not the equality we want. We want an equality where everybody is advancing. So uh, it's important to uh, 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 underline or emphasize positive and substantive equality. Uh, and sustain equality with embedded permanent corrective tools and measures. So it's not a matter of enthusiastically establishing a policy, uh, investing a lot at some point, since it's a permanent situation, even the demographic factors will have to be, to be uh, taken into consideration. So there must be a permanent corrective measure within the system. Otherwise, it will be the up and down. They make progress and go down. So it is feasible. It is possible. It has been done historically. How do African countries align themselves to that uh, path? of introducing these permanent and, and corrective uh, measures. So these are some of the, the uh, matters that relate to uh, these uh, SDGs. So the point here is that the SDGs provide a framework, but what are the implications for the African countries? This is really to take things in their own hands, is to manage their resources. It to be to be serious about the future. I was in a, a, a conference uh, uh, two years ago, and I was sharing here at Cornell, uh, Professor Ehrenberg, uh, who is about to retire. He organized a series of talk about research and promoting the new researchers 30, 20, uh, 40, 50 years from now. When you know, as a human being, Unless they invent something drastic, you may not be there. But your concern is thinking of the society, where you imagine your society to be. This is where the African leadership and the African people should be uh, engaging uh, in. 
So the SDGs, MDGs, they provide the framework and uh, the evaluation from the last experience. Many, many the commitment of support, uh, they didn't uh, materialize. Um, but some countries made progress. There's another matter I didn't have uh, time to emphasize, is the quality education. It's not just processing people through the system. It's making sure that they learn, um, that they have the actual possibility of learning. And there are different ways of measuring the equality, chances to enter in the system, but it's not enough to enter. How do we make progress? We make progress, we finish, we complete, and then how is the outcome uh, uh, used in the society? So, Thank <laughs> you.